Good morning, girl. Uh, dear, dear hosts, um, Madam Minister, um, uh, ladies and, and gentlemen, it is really a pleasure for me to be here this morning, and I have to tell you that uh, your invitation has given me a, 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 a quite a splendid opportunity to appreciate the beauty of the Norwegian landscape <laughs> in the in the winter. <laughs> and and uh, uh, if if you allow me, I would also like to say that normally I would uh, speak Norwegian. And uh, I have made earlier several attempts uh, to do that at similar conferences. But I, then I realized that I am an ideal diplomat when it is about Norwegian, because I understand everything, but I cannot say anything. <laughs> uh, even if I can say, some of our, my closest friends told me that I have to reserve my Norwegian to, to, the, to the adversaries to our adversaries, not to our friends. And since in Norway we have only friends, I am condemned to speak English. Uh, if you allow me, I would just like to, to start by saying that uh, that's reminding of the, of the ancient story about uh, President Yeltsin of, uh, of Russia, who in the 1990s uh, was asked the question, how was the situation in Russia? And then he said, I have a short answer and I have a long answer. So which, which one first? And then said, first, the short answer. He said, it's good. <laughs> and, and then they said, and what's the long answer? He says, it's not good. <laughs> <laughs> now, in, in the case to apply the same somehow to the European Union and the economic and financial situation in the European Union, I might say that the short answer is, it's not good. <laughs> And the longer answer, which I would present to you shortly, is it's improving, or it's not so bad. Um, and um, it's important to, 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 to say at the very beginning that, um, that um, I think I have to just to move, move like this, yes, that I don't entirely agree with these, uh, with these uh, slides. And before going to the slides themselves, I'd just like to say what could be the main message from uh, us, the European Union, to this very important gathering, knowing very much how important a partner you are for our companies, how large a part of your industrial production you are exporting to the EU, how close, uh, yes, thank you, how close um, relationship you have with our own economic actors in the European Union. So it's very important what I, it's a responsibility on me, what I say to you. And first, yes, there is an economic and financial crisis going on. And it has shaken somehow the foundation of uh, what we know as European Union, European economic integration, or European integration as a whole. And it has also affected levels of production. It's not just the crisis itself. It's also probably the times we are living, the effects of emerging competi competition all over the world, our relatively low, uh, I would say, innate capacity to grow. And certainly the fact that we are living in an advanced, prosperous welfare society with democratic political systems. And the question is, is that all, that the fact that we want to preserve the European welfare model, the democratic society, and the benefits our populations enjoy, is it for us an advantage or is a handicap? And our response is, no. It's it's an advantage, and we want to enjoy, continue that advantage. We want to make Europe competitive, equipped to face the challenges of the next decades and century, preserving democracy and welfare society. And that's very important. Some of the models which are coming up as competition for us are models we cannot follow. We have to follow our own model and equip it better for the pressures of the future. Do we have a chance to succeed? And I would like to tell you that we are all together in it. It's not just the European Union. Somehow in a broader notion, 
about the community of democratic nations of the West, the European Union, certainly the transatlantic community. So it's a broad issue, not just an issue for the European Union. And yes, we have to, to, to respond quickly. And the crisis has put a pressure on us, and therefore we have to respond, I would say, in a very quick manner. And I have to admit, as a representative of the European Union, that quick decision-making and the European Union are two concepts not always compatible. <laughs> so therefore, we can use also the time to really to do things which have to be done, and the pressure use it as a source of energy. Whether we will succeed or not, time will tell us. The second thing I would like to say is that you Norway, you are a very important component of all that effort. You see the effect of the crisis here and there, maybe as you have less opportunities in, side, in the European Union to invest, to have, to sell your products. And I imagine that some of you are feeling this, some others might not. It depends on the country, it depends on the sector, it depends on a lot of circumstances. And therefore, it is important to understand that whatever happens, the European Union is a major area for your activities, and it will not change. Your exports go 70, 75, 80% of your exports go to the EU. All of us, we are looking at other opportunities in other places. Why? Because we need to complement the relatively slow-growing market of, the, of Europe with others but still the basis for many of our economic actors remains here. So therefore, we have a common interest in speeding up innovation, economic development. And I would like to say this will create specifically for you additional opportunities very soon. We say we would like to generate growth through three main methods. We say inclusive growth. And, and I think right now, before me, you have heard about the beauties of the Nordic model. Yes, you are an inclusive society, and you have experiences that will give us additional opportunities to all of us, but also to you, in spreading out some of the benefits of that kind of inclusive model. Second, we want to have smart growth, although still we are not exactly know what does the word smart means. But it's definitely about going forward innovation. It's about, I would say, being in the forefront, maintaining our position or regaining our position in the forefront. Of. And in some areas, some may be relatively specialized. In some areas, Norway is very much at the forefront. So our own program will create to you additional opportunities. And the third, we would like to have green growth. And we think that fighting against climate change and developing green technology should not be a burden, should be an additional opportunity for us to generate growth. And once again, you are at the forefront of that in many fields. So what I would like to say <coughs> to the crisis, yes, creates difficulties, but it also generates opportunities. And as we will gradually get out of it, probably the additional opportunities will gradually outweigh the difficulties we face. At least that is our hope. Do we have the guarantee? No. But do we have the common interest in working for this? Yes. And now I go to the slides, but now I don't have much time for my slides. Anyway, I, I would just like to say that we, we don't feel that this is our crisis only. It's not the Euro crisis, and we don't use the term the Eurozone crisis. It came from elsewhere. As you remember, it started not in the Eurozone. And we think that it's a global issue. But it's an issue that has hit very much the EU because there are many countries inside the European Union, at least several of the member states, that have high debts. And we have to diminish the debt itself, but also we have to spread out the impact of that excessive debt all over the EU, which is a, which is a, a difficult issue. And at the same time, yes, the euro was prepared for good times. It was not prepared for bad times. And we are now working in strengthening the basis of the euro. I, I, I'm sure you know all this. I just wanted to, to recall it. As you see, there are some countries which have, the debt is very uneven in the European Union. Some countries which have very large debt compared to their GDP, and others which have very low debt. Some of them, inside the eurozone, have practically no debt, like 
Estonia. I understand Estonia is not the biggest country in the EU, but it's an interesting example that even in the Eurozone you can have very sound uh, financial uh, management. And we are developing a kind of what we call, and I apologize to you, in all the slides that we send to Brussels, they say European response. It's of course the EU, always. It's not Europe as a whole, it's the European Union. But, but we are developing a kind of a, 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 an integrated uh, response, basically responding to the market, regain confidence of the market, diminishing the debt, increasing sal uh, uh, financial uh, discipline, generating economic growth, and creating all the system which, is, which will give us the impression of financial stability. All three are together, and these are working now, one better, but all of them working now, and we are now in a crucial phase uh, of building up our overall EU response to the crisis, in particular in what create the creation of what, what we call a banking union, a certain relative mutualization of the debt, common supervision mechanism for the banks, and then further on, fiscal integration, which is a difficult thing, and then completing the economic union and strengthening the foundation of... Uh, 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 of, of, the, of the democratic legitimacy, regaining a bit of confidence also by our own citizens to the EU. We still remain the largest economy in the world and the world's largest market um, uh, for goods and services. And the European Union has the largest stock of foreign direct investment in the world abroad and uh, has, the, has, the, has the largest investment from abroad. And this investment remains important. I, yesterday I just discovered that, for example, the US investment in Belgium today, the FDI, the American FDI investment in Belgium is bigger by 20% than the combined US investment in China and India. So it is still, uh, that is just Belgium, not the 27 countries. So we are a top trading partner for 80 countries in the world and obviously for Norway. So the European Union, with all the crises, remains an economic giant providing one quarter of the world GDP. And here I would like to say that there is a statement attributed <coughs> to Chancellor Merkel saying that the EU gets 7% of the world population, 25% of world GDP, and 50% of the world's spending on welfare benefits. <laughs> I don't know whether it is true, but since it was said by the German Chancellor, it has something to do with reality. <laughs> <coughs> Now, going to the, to the, to the, to the European um, industry, I think I have still some minutes. Um, I would just like to say uh, clearly that, that, that we remain a world leader in strategic sectors, and some of these strategic sectors, the automotive sector, I know are important also for, for you in this uh, part, of, part, of, part of Norway. And industry will remain the key sector as far as the exports of the European Union are, are concerned, and 80% of private sector research and development, so it's about innovation, also comes from the manufacturing area. So therefore, industry remain a key driver for innovation and research, and therefore a key actor for us to come gradually out of the present situation and generate uh, more growth. In other words, we consider that industry is the key to the success of the EU's economy. And we are under huge pressure. In 2012 and in 2013, this pressure will continue uh, to be felt. We, we have not been able to return to the levels before the start of the economic crisis. The European industrial production is 10% below the pre-crisis level. And we lost 3 million jobs in industry in Europe since in the European Union. Uh, since 2008. So there is a contraction of the activities and we have not been able to find a way to get out of this. Still, business confidence, consumer confidence continues to be low around the, the industry and the financial problems in the banking sector, I don't want to go into it, makes it difficult to, to dynamize uh, investments into the industry uh, 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 inside the, the, the European uh, Union. We expect, although, and I say this because we are going now into 19, 2013, it's not entirely fiction anymore, 
We hope that there will be a gradual recovery. The blue is the euro area, and the, 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 the green are the countries which are called, called periphery. Um, but these are the periphery. The periphery is, in this sense, means Spain, Italy, Greece, and uh, Portugal. And these are figures not coming from us, because you might say that we try to embellish the picture. These are figures coming from the IMF. So we hope very much that there will be a process that lifts us out, especially in the second half of uh, next this year, from this recession, and we gradually really can be re can return to to pre-growth level. Uh, the downturn in, in the industrial production, uh, uh, I have spoken already already uh, about it. But if you look at the at the different sectors in Europe, then the largest decline is seen in the automotive, computer, and electronics sectors. So exactly other sectors, which, as I understand, are of, my, of major importance for you. And therefore, uh, how to say? And the, and the additional problem in these sectors is that it's just not just the, the, the lower world demand, but also it's the lower internal demand. So it's a combination of both lower possibilities in the market inside the EU and lower possibilities for exports. So therefore, we are facing a particularly difficult situation, notwithstanding all the fragile improvement in the areas which are, I think, of crucial importance uh, for you. This, um, just put it for me, just to show that, that really the crisis has been something extraordinary <laughs> in the development of the European Union. As you see from 1993, which is more or less the time of your referendum, uh, that's not why they put it there. It's, it's 94 anyway. But, but you see, you see the, the, the really, that's an extraordinary. It's, it's, really, it's probably, if we will look back to it, it's the biggest crisis, not just in the history of the existence of the European Union, probably in the 20th century, bigger than 2933. So we try to, try to, to generate growth also in the industrial sector. We, we should be proud of the profound reforms already undertaken in many European countries. Um, and we are try to complement the measures undertaken in the individual member states by strong response at the overall EU level. Uh, and um, uh, we try to generate reforms and measures that complement uh, uh, by a number of proposals that made by the, by, by the European Commission, in particular, uh, by a document that many of you might know, it's called the Industrial Policy Communication. We would like to generate an overall uh, EU framework for innovation, better market conditions, uh, and especially completing the internal market, of which you are through the EA agreement an integral part, and improve possibilities for access to, to, to capitals, and then stimulating education and the necessary skills further on for the industry, for the needs on the industry. There is an action uh, plan which many of you, I, I just was put here because it is relating to the, some of the key sector for, for, for you, the CARS 2020 um, uh, action plan. This is particularly important, I think, also for you. If you haven't seen the details of this proposal, I think for many of you might be interesting because it's innovation, it's also green technology, but it's also just transforming the European car industry preparing it for the, for the next, uh, for the next uh, uh, decade. <coughs> so, overall, there are some positive developments. There is a full understanding of the gravity of the situation and the response is building up commensurate to the task. Um, and we hope that, 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 that this will now bring results also to improving our competitivity and further on, to the, at least to the return of the industrial production to pre-crisis crisis levels. This, is a, this just shows how labor costs have been, I mean, just not just going a bit down, but also getting harmonized. We know in the countries the big, big differences are now becoming more or less together. The only exception is, a good exception is Germany. But all other countries can come together in labor costs. So, 2013 still will be a difficult year. We expect there will be some stabilization of output, 
but not in all countries. The industrial policy uh, now is more adjusted to the expectations of the, of the ma major players. There's, there will be bigger focus on innovation, research development. And of course, there will be a dependence on how we go towards uh, a better response to the Eurozone crisis as a whole. This is normally uh, at the end of, uh, end of all our presentations uh, by the e EU delegation, simply because uh, it's not a question to you. It's a question to us. As a matter of fact, it's true that we have done quite a lot and we are very proud of the Nobel Peace Prize. But this puzzle, one part is the industrial policy, is not completed. So if you are puzzled, I have to tell you that we are even more puzzled. So if you have some good advice, we will always be listening to you. Thank you very much. Et hvert ord på norsk? Et hvert ord. Han er meget språkmektig, for han snakker flytende fire-fem språk, tror jeg. Seks. Og seks er seks. Fire, fire, seks. Fire, fire. To, to.